We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Is you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me, it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so, what, like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah. Now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's easy, isn't it? Like, everyone can do this hacking stuff. So, all you gotta do is just ask nicely. I like these two because they're sort of, they're kind of social engineering, right? Like they don't just go, hey, give me your password. They go, oh, what's your dog's name? You know, how long have you had the dog? And they lull them into this sort of false sense of security, which is kind of funny. But uh, there's a lot of different security stuff I could have spoken about. And I was sort of thinking about all the things that I could do and that there's literally endless material. So I thought, oh, what I'll do is I'll just sort of pick the best of it and I'll go, oh, I'll talk about Something, something security, it'll be fine, it'll be good. So uh, that's what I thought we'd do, and one of the, the places I like to start in talking about security is talking about the people who are trying to break into our security things. And I, I find this kind of interesting, right, because everyone has a perception of, of what hackers are and who hackers are and what they do and what they look like. And I thought, well, what I, I probably should do to try and help everyone visualise is go out and actually look for some hackers. And uh, this is what you find when you search for hackers. You'll notice some trends. <laughs> and these, uh, these adorn many of the stories we see about cybersecurity. And the, the trends that sort of stand out to me, I mean, okay, first of all, what do we see? What's the commonality? Hoodies, okay, thank you. All right, we've got hoodies. What else is common? Hoodies and green screens. Now, Anything with hoodies and green screens is probably going to be a hacker. Masks as well, very good. We know that they have masks too. Now, the media has to use this sort of imagery in order to convince us that there are hackers out to get us. And they have to get increasingly creative about how they represent hackers because we get acclimatised and they need to scare us just a little bit more. So they, uh, they come up with stuff like this. This is, uh, this is a, a hacker <laughs> stealing money from a bank. He, uh, basically, as best I understand it, he walks in with a bucket of something like, I think they're the dormant cyber pathogens or something like that. He walks in with those, walks in with the bucket, and he just chucks them over the floor and they crawl up the servers and then, you, you know, you, everyone gets hacked. <laughs> so, so this is the way it's being portrayed. And, and we all laugh at this, but there's a slightly serious side to it in that what the press likes to do is they like to scare us, Right. And this is about everything in the media. Like, you look at the headlines, they're all depressing and nasty, but you can't kind of help but read them. Same with security, they want to scare us. It's not just the press, they want to obviously make an impact. Security companies want to scare us as well. Because the more scared you are, the more security shit you'll buy from security companies. This is the way it works. I'll give you a perfect example of that. There's a, a little product called Cujo. Has anyone got a Cujo? No? Good. All right. So. Here's why. Cujo is a little Indiegogo project. And the idea of Cujo is that you buy a Cujo, you put it in your house, no more hackers. They're all gone. All you do is you plug it into your network. 
Now, Cujo has this video that explains who you're trying to protect your things from, and I'll show you what it does. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, how do we know he's a hacker? Hoodie and green screen. Very good. All right, we're learning. So here's the thing, though, right? He's on the computer here, and he's hacking away, and he's got the hoodie and the green screen. And I was, I was watching this, and the first time I saw it, I thought, this, it's kind of odd, because I got a, like a bit of an idea about what these guys do. And there are some things there that didn't quite reconcile to me. So I, I zoomed in on the corner of the screen. And the guy looks like he's in a web browser, which, to my understanding, is not what they normally do when it involves green screens and terminals. So, so I was thrown by this. I thought, I've got to figure out what this guy is doing. And I worked it out, and I'm going to show you how to do this and amaze your friends and family. So what you do is you go over to a website called hackertyper.net. Has anyone seen this before? All right, awesome. So what you do when you get there is you start bashing the keyboard like this. <laughs> and this is literally what is in the video to scare you so much that you buy the security shit to keep the hackers out of your bedroom. What they didn't show, though, is you can also do this, right? When you do this with your friends and family, it's like you're hacking away and going, ah, I think I can break into the Pentagon or something. Damn it, didn't work, all right? <laughs> and then what you do is you hack a bit more. And you might give it another go. You've got to, you've got to kind of convince them that nah, didn't work. And you hack just a little bit more. Yes, we're in. All right, that's how it works. That's hacking. So, so this, this is the way that these products are being promoted and sold, uh, which probably says something around the gullibility of your average consumer. But your average consumer is kind of confused by security as well. So I get that. All right, now. So that's, uh, that's how we sort of perceive hackers and the way they're being painted. But it, it might be interesting to sort of go on and, and look at a little bit more serious hacking. And I, I found something the other day. I was watching a movie. I found this little section. <laughs> right, who's seen this? <laughs> right, this is a Jason Bourne movie. I have seen SQL before that has corrupted databases. <laughs> I've written SQL before that's corrupted data. I'm not sure that's entirely what they meant, but uh, be as it may, there's people hacking here. Now, once again, how do we know they're hacking? Green screen, very good. All right, so they're out here hacking. <laughs> they're breaking into the things. And um, the thing is, though, that they're sort of implying that this kind of SQL injection, right? So you might be using a SQL injection attack to get data out of their database. And I thought, what we should do is we'll go through the mechanics of SQL injection. We'll actually, actually learn some stuff as well as have some fun. And the way I like to sort of talk about SQL injection is to start with, uh, with a blog post. And I start with a blog post written by someone else. Now, we are going to have a bit of fun at this person's expense, but let me explain why. You will see what's wrong with this shortly, and then you will see the very polite comment from me saying, just some friendly advice. I think maybe you don't want to do this. It might be better to do that. It would be really be useful. And everything was ignored, like just got no interest whatsoever. And you will see the other comments after that from the people who have then taken this code and put it in the systems that you put your valuable things in. So this is going to teach us a bunch of things. Let's go and have a look at this. This is about how to send a forgot password link on email for reset in ASP.NET C Sharp. It's kind of wordy, but you get the idea. Now I'm going to scroll down a little bit, and we'll, we'll stop somewhere, and we'll just, just sort of get some audience opinions about how we feel about some of this. Uh, let, let's not have any opinions about how we feel about web forms. We might just skip past that. Uh, let's go to here. How do we feel about uh, how do we feel about this bit? What what don't we like? Times <laughs> 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 New Roman. What kind of psychopath is this? All right, so someone said connection string. This is really not the way you want to create your connection strings. There is a convention uh, about how we would normally do this. We probably wouldn't hard code it all into your code behind. Uh, now, someone else, uh, someone else said uh, user ID SA. Well, they did not like SA in there. And there's a couple of interesting things with this. So number one, for those of you who don't know, SA is server admin. SA has effectively God rights over the database. It can do whatever it wants, which means that Every time this web application talks to the database, the anonymous person on the other end is executing a statement under a very privileged account. Now, some people say no one actually does this, right? Like, no one actually does it in a live system. So let's go and find out. We'll, 
We'll see what they're doing. Now, what I thought I'd do is we'll, uh, we'll do some Google Docs. Who knows what a Google Doc is? All right, a few people. So for those of you who don't know, and by the way, I realize with my accent, some people think I say Google Doc. It's not a doc, it's a dork. And a Google Doc is just a very carefully crafted Google search which returns things that probably shouldn't be returned. So I'll give you an example. We can go up here and we can do an in URL, in URL like so. I'm going to go and grab a saved one just here, and we'll have a look at what's going on here. All right, so we are doing in URL for FTP. You know Google indexes stuff over FTP? It's very useful. <laughs> in URL web.config. Many of you will know what a web.config is. It's a configuration file for an ASP.NET web app. It's not meant to be returned publicly. You cannot request it over HTTP. You can, however, request it over FTP. So if you leave your website with anonymous FTP enabled and someone can go and read that, well, you've got a problem. Google index it. And then we're giving it a bit of file type config just to make sure we do definitely get FTP or web.configs accessible over FTP. Some number of results have been returned. <laughs> and, and what we're actually getting here is we are getting the web.configs of production web applications. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them exposed publicly. Uh, <laughs> some of them are government. <laughs> and this is exactly what it sounds like, and it just goes on and on and on. Now, uh, these are other people's files, and you don't want to sort of be drilling down, mucking around with these. Uh, apparently, if you look at a cached version, it's not hacking, though, right? Just checking. You can't see it because it is an XML file and it's not actually rendering into the screen. If we were to view source, it is someone's web.config file, exposed publicly. Now, I was going somewhere with this, though, because we were talking about, uh, talking about SA. So if I just jump back a level, and let's just whack an SA in there instead. This is really neat, actually, because you can find the way people are setting up their configuration files without actually looking at their configuration files. You can just look at the Google results. So I go, OK, well, who's using SA? And we have people using SA. So what do we got? Uh, ID, SA, password, that's twice as strong as SA. Uh, this, this one's good. So, and and th this is the pain of it, right? Because it's not just SA, it's crap passwords as well. Uh, oh, I, I have a real issue with this, right? <laughs> Who does this? <laughs> you can't do that. Anyway, so. We've got this. We've got a lot of stuff out there which is uh, easily discoverable, misconfigured. Obviously, in this case as well, if anonymous FTP is enabled on a website, it's much worse than just web.configs. You can go in and you can do stuff like uh, grab any of the files that are on there. If you're crazy enough, to, I was going to say stupid enough, but let's be generous, crazy enough to leave it open, you've probably got it open for write as well. So all sorts of things you could do. Now, jumping back to this bloke for a sec. Very often, I'll see people write code, they'll put it out online, and maybe they put it out anywhere from GitHub to Stack Overflow to whatever, and they'll have something egregiously bad, right, like this. And they'll go, this isn't really what I wanted to show, right? Like, what I'm trying to show here is password reset. Don't worry about this. You know, this is not the, the center of attention. And what you've got to remember is that whenever anybody puts any code online, other people will come and copy it and paste it into their application without reading it, without understanding it. Let me show you how I know. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, last year, we had a, little, uh, had a little issue with these. I was running a workshop. In fact, I was here at NDC in London. I went to Oslo afterwards, ran a workshop. There's a guy in my workshop who found that when we did this exercise where we, we take our mobile devices, we proxy it through our PCs, there's this piece where we look at how our mobile apps are communicating to services. Anyway, this guy, he gets kind of inspired, and he goes home that night and he says, I'm going to see how my phone's talking to my car. Now, I, I didn't realize this, but in some parts of the world, it's so cold that you've got to turn your heater on before you get to your car. It's not a problem we have. But uh, apparently, that's what you do. You pull out the app, and you go, heater on, you get out, and everything's warm. So he wanted to figure out how his app was talking to his car. And he worked it out, and he came in the next day and he was really excited. And he said, look, uh, <laughs> I figured out what happened. The identifier that told the service which car to turn the heater on and off, get the battery status, pull the trip history, 
The only identifier that was used was the VIN number. Now, in case you don't know what the VIN number is, and remember, this is the secret. This is effectively the API key. That secret you can find printed in the windscreen of every car, which is not a good place to put your secrets. Worse than that, not only is it in the windscreen of every car, but the last few digits are innumerable. Okay, so all the, the first bits of the VIN number are like where it was created, what year, you know, what country they made it in. And then you've got these digits, like four or five digits at the end, you just keep rotating and you can get different cars. Anyway, so this happened and it wasn't real good. And uh, we tried to get Nissan to fix it and Nissan were like, you know, we'll get around to it, don't worry about it. They didn't, I eventually published this and then suddenly they decided it was important. And they turned the service off. Now I am going somewhere here because this is about copying and pasting code. So they took a long time to get it back up and they finally got the service back up and they published their application, all right? So they published their iOS application to consumers who own Nissans, and it looked like this. Now, can anyone see any problems with this app? All right, so <laughs> if we sort of jump down towards the bottom, we can see something which is genuinely not a consumer-facing message. And we were intrigued, okay? The guy I did this exercise with myself, we're going, well, this is really interesting. I wonder how this happened. And we figured it out because if you go over to Stack Overflow, you can actually find exactly what they copied and pasted because it is just down here. So they are literally, going, this is Nissan engineers, multi-billion dollar multinational building freaking cars, you know? It's not just little web apps. Copied and pasted the code, put it out there. So every time you see some crap code somewhere and you think, well, this isn't, you know, no one's going to worry about this, Someone is going to copy and paste it somewhere. So this is what people do. Now, getting back to this bloke, and we were actually talking about SQL injection, let me show you why I like this post. It's quite handy. Let's start here. So we've got some SQL here. We've got a, a SQL statement. How do we feel about this? Is this a show of hands? Who thinks it's good? Let me rephrase this. From a SQL injection perspective, who thinks it's good? Only a few people. Who thinks it's bad? Who's undecided? Is there anyone? Because it's really bright. Is anyone left? Yeah. All right. Uh, the people that were brave enough to say it's good are correct insofar as this is resilient to SQL injection. And what we mean by that is that when we look at this TXT email field and you get the value out of the field, no matter what email address you enter into the field, it won't change the structure of the query because we can see in the query We've got an at symbol here before email. And what that means is, is that this then goes down to here and it's added as a parameter. No matter what value we put in the text field, it won't change the structure of this query. So this is good. How do we feel about the next one? <laughs> Who thinks this is good? Who thinks it's bad? Oh, that's better. All right. So. And this is one of the reasons why I show this blog post, because it's, it's actually a really good example of parameterization right next to the bad way of doing it. Parameterization's the good way, next one's the bad way. Now, if the penny hasn't quite dropped, imagine I did this, right? Imagine I decided to sign up into this web application and then go into a password reset, and I used an email address of, and here's what you've got to do. Imagine I'm, it's going to go in here. Imagine my email address was single quote, semicolon, drop table, login table, dash, dash. Because the dash, dash will comment out the little apostrophe that's left on the end. What would happen is it would just drop the login table. I know it would drop the login table because it's got SA rights. It can delete anything in the database. So this is problematic. This is, again, good because it shows the bad stuff and the good stuff right next to each other. And as I was saying before, I, I kind of went down here and went, look, you know, we all make mistakes friendly feedback, you know, maybe you want to think about this. And one of the things that got me is that as we go, I don't know what this guy's on about, but uh, <laughs> as we go down, we, we get, you know, this sort of stuff. And this is what makes me think people take this code and reproduce it, and then we now have that as part of our lives. And it's extremely worrying. You know, nice and easy to understand. Well, certainly easy to understand. Um, and what's interesting as we go along as well, though, is <laughs> at some point here, you, you kind of feel that 
maybe there was beginning to be a little bit of trolling happening. <laughs> uh, so someone in here as well said they used it for their bank. Where was that? Um, yeah. So <laughs> let's let's hope that's not my bank. <laughs> All right. So. We've seen the bad of SQL injection, right? So we've seen vulnerable code. But the bit that we've got to add to the picture now is how do hackers find your bad applications and then how do they exploit your vulnerable code? And what I thought I'd do is I'd go out and find a tutorial online about how to mount a SQL injection attack. And I found one here. And the reason why I wanted to pick this is that as you listen to this, just have a think about the the, the genre of the individual who's doing the tutorial. Let's do a professional video. Let's actually show you how the concept works. And um, I'm using um, uh, the SQL or SQL method here, SQL injection. Now, <laughs> when I heard that, every time he said that, I couldn't help but think of this. That was the only thing I could think of. <laughs> Except, of course, it's a hacking squirrel. <laughs> so anyway, we'll let him go on. But I, I will teach you how to do that, and, and there are easy methods to do this. So do not worry. Do not worry about this. Um, yeah, um, I just uh, don't worry about the little jump cut there. <laughs> Maybe not such a sophisticated hacker. You know, just a just a point there. But where I'm going with this is that a lot of the time it is children, right? And this is clearly a child who's doing this. And you'll sort of see where he goes, and 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 we'll talk a little bit about the ramifications of kids doing this sort of stuff. So what he does next is he goes over to a particular hacking site which has all of these different sort of vulnerabilities and ways of teaching kids how to break into systems. And in this particular case, he's gone to a site that lists Google Docs. Now, we all know what Google Docs are now. And he's highlighted one here. In URL, buy.php, question mark, category equals. So he's looking for something with a query string. And he's copied this query string. Let's see what he does with it. Um, sorry. Oh. I don't know. I forgot that Firefox can't do that. So the first site was this one, which is literally this. So if I just go on here, yeah, this opens up this. So the, the, the thing that should really strike you here is how indiscriminate this is. He's just gone, I want to hack some shit. I'm just going to put in a Google Doc, and I'm just going to grab the first site. You know. And for everyone who says, I don't think we've got reason to be concerned about security because we don't have anything of value. You know, who's going to care? It's because of stuff like this, because people are just continually scanning around looking for things that are vulnerable, potentially vulnerable. We don't even know if it's vulnerable yet, because all he's done is just search for query strings. Let's see what he does now. OK, so with this extension, what we do is put a little apostrophe here, little comma-ish. Put it there, press Enter, and there we go. So this means that we have an error in the database so there's an error in their database. So and their database is MySQL server. There you go. So uh, because it's my um, SQL or MySQL, we can target it and grab all the info. <laughs> so what he's done, the the apostrophe is obviously being treated as either terminating a string somewhere or beginning a string somewhere, or at some point in time the apostrophe was unexpected. It should be there as encapsulating a string. It's in the wrong place. Internal database has thrown an error. Now, keep in mind, like he's got no idea what's actually happened. He's got no idea of the code you just saw or how this sort of thing would happen. He's just gone, if I find a URL with a query string and I put an apostrophe in there and I get an error, could be game on. So here's what he does. So next, you want to um, have this program, Havage. All right, now this brings us to the fun bit. So what he's done is he's gone and grabbed a piece of uh, free SQL injection software, right? So Havage is uh, freely available, and it makes it really easy for anyone who hasn't done SQL injection before to break into a website. Now, who here has done SQL injection before? Not many. OK, who would like to do SQL injection? <laughs> who would like? Someone at the front. Someone at the front. Someone, like, oh yeah. yeah, that's a very half-hearted hand, but come on, you can do it. <laughs> I, I did express the convict heritage thing last night. They are watching me. I can't do this, so you have to do it. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you to do the SQL injection. This will be fun, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> now, I've got this particular site here which you can hack without being deported to Australia. 
And what you do here is I'll get you to scroll down on the screen a little bit. No, do it. It'll be fun. Seriously. Don't worry. <laughs> all right. So you're going to scroll down. You're going to choose one of these manufacturers, all right? You've got three different manufacturers. Pick the one that you like. Going for the local one. All right. Very good. All right. Now, we see in the URL, the URL has got a question mark order by, right? So we've got a query string in there. So you'll, you look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> Let's grab that URL. <laughs> he did say he'd never done it before. All right. We'll, uh, we'll copy it. Copy the whole URL. Too late now, mate. It's on camera. <laughs> All right, copy the whole URL. Now, down on the taskbar, there's this little carrot. Uh, and this is Havage, right? This is the software that the kid just before grabbed. I'll get you to maximize that window because we're going to want some real estate for this. And then we're going to drop that into the target there. Very good. And we're going to analyze it. So see there's an Analyze button to the right. We hit that one. Beautiful. Now, what this is doing is it's making HTTP requests to that website of mine trying to figure out if there's a vulnerability. And it's just automating the whole thing. Now, you see the last line there says, DB name, hack yourself first, underscore DB. It's managed to actually extract the name of the internal database from the system. What we want to do now is we want to get the tables out of the system because we're going to start having a bit of explore around, see what we actually like. All right, let's click on uh, get tables. That'd be good. And it's going around, it's making more queries. These are all our internal tables. We'll just let that one finish loading. Now, actually, what was your name? I didn't ask you. Taylor. Taylor, okay. And you've never done this before. All right, this is going to be awesome. All right, Taylor. So, Taylor, choose the table you'd like. Well, should we vote? What's the most interesting looking table here? User profile. Okay, let's get user profile table. We'll check that one. Yeah, and now let's get the columns of that, Taylor. All right, it's going away. It's going to get all the columns. Now we'll let these ones load. Uh, vote again. What are the most interesting column names? Username, password, or is it email, password? Yeah, email and password. Let's get those. All right, and now you're going to get the data. Get data. And there we go. Job done. But that is SQL injection. That is the whole thing end to end. So give Taylor a round of applause because he's done well. <laughs> Thanks, mate. It's good on you. All right, so you see how easy it is from end to end? Like, it is ridiculously simple. So we've gone through and we've gone, all right, well, this is how bad code is written. This is how people discover sites that are at risk. And then this is how we go through and exploit this stuff. And it is an absolute piece of cake. This is why we have so many SQL injections these days. Now, incidentally, that was what brought TalkTalk Talk undone as well. So I spoke about TalkTalk Talk the other day, last night. Uh, this is what the kid did. He used freely available SQL injection software, and he knew how to copy and paste a URL. Now, the, the problem with this is that you've got kids that are able to do this so easily themselves. And what ends up happening is very often they will see a video like the one I just showed you, or they'll be coerced by other people. And they sort of fit into this, this category that we'd refer to as a useful idiot. Not you, Taylor, don't worry. <laughs> but the term useful idiot, this actually makes a lot of sense, right? Useful idiot is someone who's not necessarily aware of what they're doing, but they're being used by other people. And if we took out Stalin and Lenin and went with anonymous, this is often what it is, right? So think about the hacktivists online. It's people saying, I wonder if I can convince these kids to do my bidding for me. I don't have to hack stuff. I just have to tell them it's a good idea. Now, speaking of idiots, uh, Come on, it's the big day. We couldn't help it. <laughs> there is relevance to this. So Trump was, uh, he was in the news recently. He had a little issue with his website. And this is what the headline said. It said, uh, Trump's website got dramas, could have been chaos. You know, fake media probably, I don't know. <laughs> but it was actually an interesting issue because what the story was about was that on Trump's website, he had a piece of code like this. I don't think he did, someone did. Someone wrote this code, and obviously what's happening here is it's just a script file, right? It's being embedded from GitHub, and in this case, it's a jQuery mask library. It just puts little masks on text fields with the sort of data that you'd expect to enter. Now, the reason why it made news is because what people were saying was that if someone had changed that script file on that site, it could have actually changed the behavior of Trump's website. 
Because you think about it, right? Like, what can you do if you can run JavaScript on a website? And the answer is pretty much anything. Imagine how creative any of you could get if you could run whatever JavaScript you wanted on Trump's website. You know, and that's, that's basically where we are. So this is the point they're making. Now, I want to sort of demonstrate the problem, and I'll, I'll demo a fix as well, because there's an interesting little security control we have. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to jump over to uh, Urban Dictionary, which is this one here. Now, this is entirely coincidental. If you go to Urban Dictionary right now, this is the number one article at the top. It wasn't when I prepared this. I opened this up like an hour ago, and I thought, oh, man, <laughs> what are the chances of this? Anyway, let me show you the problem. So this is Urban Dictionary. Now, if we jump into the source code of Urban Dictionary and we search for Cloudflare, what you'll see is that they are loading Cloudflare, or rather they are loading a library off Cloudflare. OK, it's just a JS library. They're using Cloudflare's public CDN, because if they use a public CDN, it gets distributed all the way around the world, so it's fast. They don't pay for the bandwidth themselves. It comes off Cloudflare's bandwidth. All this is free. Who uses CDNs like this? OK, now, one of the things that a lot of people say is, and this is sort of the tinfoil hat brigade, but they say, this is dangerous, because if you do this, you could be like Trump. And I know that sounds terrible, but what they're saying is that someone could actually change that file, and your site would have problems. And if you have a think about it, the, the, like the chances of it happening are not real good. I don't think someone's going to go and maliciously change files on Cloudflare without it creating like a massive issue very, very quickly. But let's address the problem. Let's humor them and go, OK, well, how do we fix this? Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a little demo of this. If I open this file here, we'll just click through to it in a new tab. This is the file. It's just a great big whack of JavaScript. goes all the way down to there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into Fiddler for a second. Now, who has used Fiddler before? All right, just about everyone. Who has used Fiddler script? Just about no one. And that's how it normally is. What you can do with Fiddler script, if I go to there and I go down here and I go down to one of these events, I can do things like change the request. So when it goes to on before request, so just for those of you who haven't used Fiddler, Fiddler is an HTTP proxy. You open it up, your web browser starts sending all of its traffic through Fiddler before it goes to the website. On before request allows you to modify the traffic when the browser is sending a request out. On before response, which is this next one down here, allows you to modify the traffic when the response is coming back from the web server. So here's what we're going to do. Jump down to on before response. Now, I have got a little bit of code down here, which is saying, for requests that go out to Cloudflare, we're going to Trumpify it. OK? Now, what that means is I have added a little bit of JavaScript here, such that it's going to modify these JS files. Now, ultimately, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to say what happens if the JavaScript file is changed into something that it's not meant to be. And that was the concern with Trump. So I'm just going to make sure that we are actually capturing traffic in Fiddler. We'll jump back to this file. I'll give it a hard reload. And I'll see if it's got my new Trumpification script, which is now Word, in the bottom. And it does. We've got Trumpify down here. So that's what Fiddler script does. It's just modified my response as it's came through. And now I go over to Urban Dictionary, and I give this one a reload. And we'll see if it's been Trumpified. So remembering, this is sort of emulating what might happen if we'd mucked around with the source file. All right, it's been Trumpified. Now, this is a concern, right? Like, this website has no resiliency to that script file being changed. So I'm going to show you another way around this, which allows you to have your cake and eat it too. So it allows you to have your CDN and be resilient to this sort of thing. If I go over to my website over here, who's used this website, by the way? So for those of you who haven't, this is a, a data breach aggregation website. Uh, sites get hacked. I load it in here. You can then go and find where you've been hacked. Who's found themselves in uh, Dropbox? LinkedIn? Ashley Madison? Uh, it's always one guy at the back. It's always a guy, too. Funny, that. Anyway, if I look at the source code of my site here, I have got a little bit down the end where I'm also using Cloudflare's CDN. OK, so there we go. I'm pulling jQuery from the CDN. I can click on that file, and I can see that it is a great big whack of jQuery. Now, the script that I just added to Fiddler script is going to modify this when I reload it. It was cached. 
So let's give it a reload and we'll see what happens. We'll reload the file there. And again, what we're trying to do here is just emulate what would happen if the file was maliciously changed upstream of the browser. That is now a Trumpified script. If I go back to my website and I reload, it's now going to get the Trumpified script. And we're going to see if my site gets Trumpified as well. And Trumpification, for those who aren't familiar with the term, just means putting an image of Trump in his hair in the source of every div, background of every div. Now, what you'll see as this loads is that it's not going to happen, OK? No Trumpification, which is good. However, other things have happened, and this is where it gets interesting. If I jump over to the console, we'll see I've got a little warning here, a little error. Failed to find a valid digest in the integrity attribute for resource, blah, 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 with computed SHA-256 integrity. I want to show you how this works. So it's actually a really neat security defense. If I jump back over to my source code here, see how I've also got an integrity tag here, all right, or an integrity attribute. It's a SHA-348 hash, which is great, big, and clunky like so. And what this is, is this is the hash of that jQuery file. Now, have a think about how this works and why it makes sense. At some point in time, you have got to have an external library that you trust. OK, now this would normally be one that you load onto your own website. But then you say, such as in the Trump case, I actually want to use it or I actually want to load it from another location. I want to load it, say, from a CDN so it's fast and I don't pay for it. What you do is you create the SHA-348, or you can do 256, hash of that, of that script file and you add it as an integrity attribute. What happens then is when the browser downloads this file that we see just over here to the left, it goes and says, is the hash of it equal to the one over here? And if it is, it runs. And if it's not, then you get the error we saw before. So this allows you to make sure that it's only ever the exact file that you want that actually loads. Now, the other cool thing here is that if we go back to my site and I go and do something like, let's actually search for my email address, and we'll see how badly I've been pwned, which is not really good. Uh, it will still execute. So this is jQuery that does all of that. So even though I blocked the jQuery from Cloudflare, the jQuery is still run. And the way you do that is also over here in the source code. So just down here, I've got a fallback. All right. Now, often people will do this when they want to have a fallback position from a CDN because maybe my website is still up, but the CDN is down. Not very likely, but people say that. And it just looks to see if window.jQuery exists. And if it doesn't, it just writes out a script reference to my local file. So this is neat, right? Like I can say, let me always get the free one that's fast. And if in this really crazy scenario that it gets modified and the hash doesn't work, load it from my own site. And if you want to know how to create that hash, all you do is you get the URL that you trust. And you go to a site like this, the SRI hash generator. And remember, this is sub-resource integrity, SRI. And you say, let's create the hash. And it goes away and it says, all right, let's download that file, create the hash. This is the tag you need. So any stuff that you're embedding from other locations that you expect to always be the same and not modified, you can use one of these on. Now, browser compatibility. Who uses Chrome? Who uses Firefox? Who uses Internet Explorer? Gee, you're brave. <laughs> uh, the Internet Explorer people, how do we put this nicely? Um, let's just go and search. Can I use SRI? And here's the issue. So we have got actually a pretty good representation here. So globally, we've got about almost 58% of browsers in use right now can use SRI. Basically, everything Firefox, everything Chrome. The Microsoft things and the Apple thing don't recognize SRI. You can still use the attribute, but they'll just go, I wonder what that attribute is. Don't know. Just ignore it. Hopefully, we'll see this coming. Microsoft has been adding support for things like content security policy, which they didn't have. It's now coming to Edge. Maybe this will come later on. But hey, look, it's really good for the majority of people that are using browsers that support it. All right, so that's, uh, that's SRI, and SRI is enormously useful for this sort of stuff, and I strongly recommend you give that a go, because it's pretty cool stuff. Moving on to something else. There are a lot of sites out there that, believe it or not, offer you stuff for free on the internet, 
or offer you things which they ultimately can't deliver on. A lot of scam sites. There's a site here that helps you get verified on Twitter. And this popped up as a promoted tweet on Twitter, which is all kind of meta, right? <laughs> this is not a very legit site, because you go in here and you go, all right, I'd like to get verified. I want to have the little blue thing. It'll be awesome. And it takes you over to this page, and you enter all your credit card details. Um, don't enter all your credit card details. It's, there's a couple of reasons why not. I mean, first of all, obviously, it's not loaded securely. It's loaded over HTTP. Incidentally, Chrome 56, which is going to drop any day, if you put a credit card form or a password form on a website loaded over HTTP, it's about to start giving you big warnings any day. So if you're doing that, now's a really good time to stop. Don't do that. So uh, this site doesn't look overly legit. But you know, we were poking around on this the other day of a couple of people. And <laughs> a couple of people sort of pointed something out to me and said, there's a funny thing with this site, right? If you take out the file path, you get this. And then if you drill down into one of these files, you get this. <laughs> so. <laughs> What this scam site was doing was storing everyone's personal data in this HTML file with their credit cards, with their postal data, with everything just sitting there. And like that was bad enough, but even worse was now you get to see everyone who's been sucked in thinking they're going to get verified by paying money. I went and registered on myself just to check what would happen, and that happened. So, so they, they may have other issues on their site as well. This is what happens. We've got a lot of scammers out here who make attempts to rip people off and generally just do a really, really bad job of it. So this was one of them. There's another interesting one, which is these guys. Anyone ever seen Comantra? I'll put it another way. Has anyone ever, um, I'm sure this happens in the UK, anyone ever been at home of an evening, it's like 6 o'clock, you're getting dinner, putting the kids to bed, and someone calls up from a really long, long, long way away and they say, where Microsoft, your computer's got viruses. Does that happen here? All right. Good. It's not just us. <laughs> so this happens all the time in Australia. And these guys keep calling up and going, you know, you've got viruses. If you don't fix it, then you're going to charge you money and the cops will come and get you. And they just make up any bullshit reason to try and suck you into the scam. Now, this used to happen to me a lot. And I got kind of sick of it. And I thought, OK, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a very special VM which is this one here. And I set up this VM, and I thought, you know, look, I mean, they're not going to be this stupid. They're going to see this, and you know, <laughs> they'll realize what's going on. But I set this up, and they called up, and they said, you know, your computer's got viruses. Oh, really interesting. Uh, we're going to help you fix it. And I let them go through the entire process of how they fix it. And just in case you, you've always wondered, like, where does this lead in? What they do is they say, do this, hit Windows R, OK, so we can run, and fire up the event viewer. And then you fire up the event viewer, and they say, OK, right, what I want you to do now is to go into Windows Logs, go into System, scroll down, and look at the things here, and then tell me if you see anything in here like a warning. Oh, shit, that's a virus. And this is what they tell you, right? As soon as they see a warning or an error, or as soon as you see one, they go, that's a virus. You're very badly infected. We're going to need to clean your PC. <laughs> They then get you to go through and go to one of these free remote, uh, remote desktop sites, and they take control of your computer. And basically, it all goes downhill from there. Now, back here, I ended up uh, creating a video. There's like a, an hour and a half video here that's been viewed over a million times because people just like seeing how badly the scammers ultimately get screwed over. Speaking of them being screwed over, <laughs> I was looking at these guys the other day. And I thought, I wonder if they're still around. And they are. They're still here. This is one of the people who fix your PC. Um, probably not. And I've gone in there and thought, what's always interesting with, uh, with websites like this is to look at the robots.txt file. Because the robots.txt file often tells you many interesting things about what they're doing on the site. So I found the robots.txt. <laughs> and this is what's there live at the moment. So. It's just another case of scammers, uh, believe it or not, often not being particularly bright. <laughs> now, sometimes we, we sort of see these incidents and we think, well, um, 
you know, maybe there was someone malicious who, who caused this to happen. Maybe there was someone malicious who caused the files to leak. And there's this saying I'm, I'm really fond of when it comes to this sort of thing, uh, which talks about stupidity as opposed to malice. And often it is, right? Often we see really bad security somewhere that's not necessarily bad because someone was smart enough to break in, but it's bad because someone was stupid enough to put it out there in the first place. Let me give you some examples. There was this site very recently, and this is an uh, Indian clinical pathology site. Now, what these guys do is they take a whole bunch of blood tests, they obviously figure out what's what, how much cholesterol you got and what your white cells are, all this sort of thing, and they do reports. And they had an incident a little while ago which resulted in them having to make a statement. And the statement ended up looking like this. Now, it, it's the second line here that really strikes me. Because what they're going is, our website was hacked. Someone hacked into our website. We're going to talk to the cyber cell of the Mumbai police. Sounds quite scary. So they said, OK, they got hacked. Let me explain how they got hacked. The way they got hacked is they published all their pathology reports to a folder with directory listing enabled. This is how you get hacked. This is why they're going to the Mumbai police, because they published all the files publicly. And all that happened was eventually someone found it. And then they told me, and I tried to tell them, and they actually didn't care that much. This is a scary thing. This is pathology reports for things like HIV tests, personally identifiable information, whether you're HIV positive or not. 43,000 files in this directory. Took a lot of hard work to actually get it taken down. This was incompetence as opposed to malice. I'll give you another good example. This one happened uh, around about the same time, and I'll try it like this. Anyone work for Michael Page? No? Anyone work for Capgemini? No? No, I can't see any hands up in the audience at all. Interesting. Uh, so, so what happened is Michael Page had a bit of an issue. And it's, it's sort of summarized here. And again, what I find really interesting about the way this is phrased is it says, uh, you know, we regret to reform you. Da, da, da. Unauthorized third party illegally gained online access. Someone broke into our systems. You know, someone malicious, must have been malicious because they had unauthorized access. And the way they did it is they basically browsed a folder. And again, this is what it is. So this was a development server with backups of production data, about 30 gigabytes worth of data backed up to it, from different countries all the way around the, all the, way around the world, which you can see there. And someone was just scanning through the IPv4 address range, going, I wonder if this IP address is open. I wonder if it's open to HTTP. I wonder if I can do an index of. And I wonder if there is a .sql.gzip file in there. And here we are, and they found it. And this is how a lot of these data breaches are happening, because they're just going, well, we'll just take the system from your publicly facing database backups. I'll give you an idea of just how much stuff is out there. We've been doing a lot of Google Docs today. So if we were to go and do a Google Doc, and we'll do a bit of uh, index of, we'll do a bit of index of SQL gzip. So again, think about what we're doing here. This is it. This is the extent of the search. And here we go. All right, over 2,000 results. And it's stuff like this just published publicly to the web. Many of these have database backups going back years. They just back them up, put them on a web folder. Because it's convenient, right? It makes life very easy. Makes life very easy for, for bad guys, unfortunately, but this is what they do. All right, so that is unfortunately how easy a lot of that gets. Now, likewise, as well as doing things like SQL.gzip, we could always do a bit of uh, .git. People publish the Git repositories publicly. They don't know it because someone has probably just gone and FTP'd the entire root of their development website up to their production website. And here we go. Fortunately, no one puts sensitive things in Git because you don't do that with source control, right? <laughs> but they do. And there are automated scanners that just run around the internet looking for this sort of stuff. And when they find it, they download your source code repository. And even if they don't get sensitive things, they get all of this internal information about the way your app is structured. And then they possibly find vulnerabilities in your code. It's just a Google Doc away. Now, lead you on to something different. Because there's one more thing I want to look at in terms of the ease with which we can find 
data and vulnerable systems. Now, I couldn't help doing one more Trump, uh, but there, there is a little Family Guy related lesson which I think is interesting. Hey, I got two of these phone books, didn't know if you wanted one. Hey, how long have we known each other? Long time. And yet we've never discussed mother's maiden names, the names of old pets, high school mascots, favorite teachers. Heck, I don't even know the last four digits of your social. <laughs> Now, this is the thing, right? Like, all of this information is really valuable to people who want to steal your identities, break into your accounts, identify themselves to other services. I mean, how many times do you call up? Have a think about it. Next time you call up your bank or your insurance company or something like that, consider the questions they ask you and how readily discoverable the answers are. Because a lot of it you'll find on social media profiles, database breaches you've been in, check on have I been pwned, see how much of your data is actually sitting out there. The thing with it though is that we consequently put a lot of effort into protecting our identities. And for those of us building systems, we're hopefully very conscious that we don't want to expose that sort of information publicly. And we go to great lengths to make sure no one can find our personal data. Unless you're these guys. Now, there is a reason I'm showing what I'm about to show, and the reason is, is that they are well aware of it, and I'm going to show you all the reasons why they've justified it later on, and they seem to be happy for it to happen. Does anyone use Strawberry Net? Your sister. All right, now, it is normally a service used by women. It's got a lot of cosmetics on it. It is a very popular service. You're going to want to talk to your sister after this. I could ask your sister's email address, but I don't think we'll do this on stage. You do it afterwards and you'll be stunned. All right, so we've got Strawberry Net. Now, Strawberry Net is a Hong Kong-based cosmetics company. And they run an online website where, as far as I understand, they've got some pretty good deals on makeup and stuff like that. So we'll jump on over to Strawberry Net, which is over here. And what you do, right, is you go, all right. And just to be clear, I'm not logged in. I'm not authenticated. Nothing like that. I cleared all my cookies even before I started. You go down here and you find something that you'd like. And you go, uh, okay, this is for guys. I might get some of this. Men's cleansing foam. All right, let's have some of that. I'm going to add it to the bag and I'm going to check out. Now, they came up with a really innovative way of streamlining the checkout process. And I want to show you how it works. Because this is a service which is predominantly used by women, we need to pick a girl's name. You don't want to pick a girl's name. Jane, good. All right. So, what you do <laughs> is you pick a name like Jane, uh, and then you pick a popular email service. Gmail. Gmail. All right, let's do Gmail. Good idea. Like that. And then you go, all right, gmail.com, isn't it? <laughs> now I would like to check out. And what it's going to do is this nice sort of streamlined checkout process, where it obviously, it takes the email address, and it goes over to the database, and it's going to try and see if it can find Jane somewhere in the system. It is thinking about it. It is in Hong Kong. Maybe it's a long way away. Come on, come on. Looking for Jane. Maybe I should have tried Julie. All right, so here we go. It has now found Jane. This is exactly what it looks like. And the reason I'm showing this one is because someone else has already found it, modified the data, and I hope it's not the person's legit data, because after you find the person, you can change the delivery address. You can, well, you can add one, you can change the billing address. So for, for you with your sister, afterwards, enter her email address into there and see if all of her personal data comes back. Now, you may be looking at this and going, gee, I hope Troy disclosed this zero day and they're not going to come and knock on his door and send him back to Australia or something like that. I did. I had a chat to them. And they had many things to say about the way that works. One of the things they had to say was that the data is returned over SSL. <laughs> okay, don't worry, it's secure. So basically, as I'm retrieving other people's personal data, someone can't hack me, <laughs> right, in, in the middle, <laughs> which, which makes me feel so much better. And then they said, well, we're PCI compliant. You know, like this, this is the most bullshit excuse ever. We're PCI compliant, don't worry. Uh, they went on and they said, well, we surveyed our customers and they like it. <laughs> All the customers I've spoken to that have seen this have used other words than like. <laughs> but the, the one I really love is when they said, ultimately, we reckon it's sufficient security. Using your email address as your password is just fine. 
This has been disclosed to them. This is the way they want to run the system. We had a big debate about it back in August, and they just went, no, nah, we'll leave it like that. So that is how easy it is to find other people's data in ways that can only be described as a feature. All right, so look, that is everything I wanted to cover, but I wanted to finish in time as well so we could do questions and things like that, because I know I've shown a lot of stuff. People often sort of want to ask more about it. So we've probably got about five minutes if people want to ask me things. Yes, at the back. What are the data protection laws in Hong Kong? But, you know, like that is a... So his question, just in case anyone heard it, is, is it not breaking data protection laws? Um, the, the thing is, and, and this sort of came across in the discussions I had with them, Hong Kong's part of China now, and there is a very, very different view of privacy over there. And yes, it's our data, and people would argue that it should come under GDPR and that comes into effect as well. But ultimately, they've just decided, no, this is the way we want to run the service. I, there is a, a small part of me, just a very, very small part of me, that would like someone to enumerate through every single possible email address. They just grab a file of a few million, find them, and then email everyone in there and go, hey, did you know this is your phone number and your address, Strawberry Net's exposing it. How do you feel about that? So I think they just need pressure to fix it. Other questions? I think everyone's like in stunned silence. Any more? Only the one. Wow, that was easy. Yes, you, sir. What colour do you uh, type on on your screen? <laughs> what colour do I type on? I don't do that. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> All right. Well, look, I hope uh, you've enjoyed that. And any other questions, hit me up on the Twitters or on my website via those two things. Thanks, guys. <laughs>